So today, I've entitled the message, Change Powered by Blessing. You're at advertisements today, and they're advertising a truck or a car, and they'll say, this truck or car is powered by, and it'll name the engine that it's powered by, or maybe the train it's powered by. And so we get accustomed to say, here it is, but it's powered by something else. And so today I want to talk to you about change powered by blessings. What does that actually mean? I'm going to recap last two messages here real, real briefly. The first one is to realize that our words have substance. Our words have substance. When you speak something, it's actually going into the person or thing, and it's creating what you're saying. So you have to be careful what you're saying because our words have substance. And we kind of walk through uh, that in, in a way that, uh, that made us maybe revisit the fact that when we speak something, God created the world with just a word. He spoke it and it happened. It became physical. And so in the same way, being created in the image of God, we ourselves, uh, when we speak, it begins to form substance in that which we're saying to others and to things. Last week we learned about where you are seated. How many were here last week? All right, learned about where we're seated. I had a chair on, uh, on the stage here and kind of walked down and said that actually you can get your counsel from two different places. You can get your counsel from the earth, which is what the world is saying, or you can come up to where Christ is seated in heavenly places, and you can get your counsel there. And the option is we can choose. We can decide to get our counsel from the world or earth, or we can come. The Bible says we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. He's seated there. And we can actually go up in faith and get our counsel from Him. And we walk through what that meant and so forth. Again, if you missed those two messages, you can catch them online on our website or our uh, YouTube channel, and it's probably posted there in the bulletin where to go. But today, I want to talk about changing the atmosphere. We sang about it this morning, changing the atmosphere through blessings. What does that actually mean? Brad Burke, I didn't bring the book in with me, but Brad Burke wrote this book that kind of inspired these series of messages called Changing the Atmosphere. And uh, one of the phrases that the Lord gave him was uh, that blessings bring change. Change doesn't always bring blessings. Blessings bring change, but change doesn't always bring blessings. And so that's kind of the core of, uh, of his message leading up to it today. And uh, so it's like when he heard that, then he suddenly says, well, what does that mean? And he went into Scripture and discovered, as, as I understood and dug into Scripture myself, what that actually meant. In Acts chapter 3, verse 26, you'll see a verse, uh, it's written there, First of all, the Bible reveals that God sends blessing upon people to initiate change for them to make. The Bible reveals that God sends blessings upon people to initiate a change for them to make. In Acts 3.26, it says, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to you first to bless you in turning away every one of you from your wickedness. Now, that's actually one of the last statements in the first sermon that Peter preached after he was filled with the Holy Spirit in Jerusalem. That was kind of his altar call. He said, and God came to you first. He blessed you first so that you could make the change and turn away from the ways uh, that you are living that are apart from God. I thought of several other verses. Uh, one is out of Romans chapter um, 5, verse 6. It says, you see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. I love that. You see, at just the right time when you needed God or when you were least expecting, He showed up. And He said, I'm here for you. You want to make a change? God took the initiative there. And then two verses later in verse 8, it says, God demonstrates his own love for us while we were still sinners, Christ died. When we could care less, Christ prepared himself to give us a blessing so that we could make a change. And then I also thought of 1 John 4, 19 that says this, we love because he first loved us. We love him. Not, we didn't start loving him. That's backwards. He loved us first in some way, some that we understood. He's God's loving me. 
And then we made a change after that. And so we know in, in Scripture, if you begin to read Scripture through these eyes, you'll discover the fact of how much God takes the initiative with us without us making a change. And then we make a change later. We prayed for people to be healed this morning, and people were healed. People, pain left. People were encouraged. People got infused by the presence of God. What did they do? The, the only thing they did was, was raise their hand. They didn't make any literal change in their life. As all they did was raise their hand, and God began to heal them. Healing is a blessing. Sometimes we think people have to make changes before God will heal them. But Jesus did it the opposite. He went in and healed people, and then they made changes. And that's hard for us to think because we've grown up in this mentality of, of first you have to obey or discipline yourself, and then you'll get the reward. That's the system that we've grown up under. That's the world system. You work, and the harder you work, then the greater reward you will get. That's what we've grown up under. That's what we're taught that we need to work, good reward. Work hard, great reward. Never mind if you lose your health and your family and your friends. You just worked hard and you got your reward. Now, I'm not saying we throw that out, but there's a higher way to live. There's a way to live, I call, you can live from the empowerment of being blessed. Live from the empowerment of being blessed. Not live from the rewards obedience based because if you live at that level and certainly that is a way to live and oftentimes that's what Christianity is made out to be that you do this and God does this you do this and God does it you work your way towards and I'm not saying you don't work but there's a, a level of thinking that's beyond rewards and obedience and that is that you live you're empowered out of just simply being blessed and so when I, I grasped this thought, I was like, well, what's the difference? Thursday morning I woke up, and Thursday's my day to, to give you an outline of what I'm going to share on Sunday. And, and, and I woke up, and God spoke to me two words. I knew exactly what they meant. Now, when I say them to you, you'll go, what? So I woke up, and I heard these two words, parking brake. Pretty weird, isn't it? Parking brake. But I knew exactly what it meant. Um, okay, let's confession time, right? How many of you have tried to drive with your parking brake on? See your hands. Oh, wow, a lot of folk here. How far did you get, you know? Did you realize it before the smoke started coming out of the wheels? You know, you could usually get in reverse and not realize it. When you start going forward, you're like, something's dragging. You got your parking brake on. You don't get very far until you turn it off. I've got a 1997 Ford truck, and I never use my parking brake. Now, any mechanics in the room will tell you this. You either use your parking brake or you do not use it at all. Because if you use it intermittently, it just stores up with dust and dirt and corrosion, and it will get stuck and it won't release. So I don't use my parking brake. But I take my truck to get inspected. What do the inspectors do? They push the bargain brake to make sure that it works. What happens? I drive my truck away, and my parking brake is stuck on the right side. I've got to take the wheel off every year and actually uh, uh, physically unstuck my parking brake on the right side so it'll run again. Uh, it's a hassle. Last year, though, I didn't have to do it. I don't know what happened. I'm not sure if it released itself or they didn't check it or what. I don't know, but I was grateful. Because about three years running, I'm taking my truck off. Because I just never use my parking brake. All right. Interesting stories. But what's the point? The point is this. If you live your life only from getting rewards from obedience, it's like driving a car with a parking brake on. You can go forward in life, but it will be kind of draggy. But when you learn to be empowered because you're blessed, then you'll take your parking brake off. And you'll go through life, and it'll be easy, and you'll be free, and you'll bless many people. But if you're living only out of, out of rewards from, being, from obeying, it's like 
the parking brake is on going through life. You know, I think of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob just to pull out uh, three guys. Abraham, he didn't obey God all the time. He lied twice about his wife. He had a son out of wedlock of, of the promise of God. He clearly disobeyed God, but did that take away his blessing? No, it didn't. See, it messes with our minds because when we're in this condition, I've got to work so God will love me and work so God will love me. It's actually just the opposite. You have to decide that he's blessed you. And so Abraham, he knew he was blessed. He, he messed up. He disobeyed God. And yet at the same time, that didn't take away his blessing. Now, I don't, I don't think you should obviously live in sin knowing that you're in sin. You repent and turn around. But sometimes we think because we mess up that the blessing's gone. No, it's not the case. Isaac, he had a few mishaps himself. Jacob, Jacob was a conniving, scheming. I mean, he stole his brother's birthright. He's just a rascal. But yet he knew that he had God's blessing. And he lived that way, and God blessed him. He lived out of blessing. He didn't live out of reward and obedience. That was a level, but there was a higher level that they lived out of. And that's where I want to take you this morning to be able to live uh, from that way. Now, I don't want you to throw away uh, the rewards that come from obedience. Please don't do that. But uh, I do want you to realize that when Christ is in you, then you can live out of blessing. Someone, I, I think it was Burke in his book, I'm kind of fuzzy where I got it, but that we always talk about the favor of God. The, is the favor of God on you? As if, as if God likes us. You know, is that what it means? That, that I have the favor of God because God likes me? And I think it's in, in the book that I read, but I remember it's that the favor of God that you have is not because God likes you, but it's because God lives in you. That's favor. God lives in you, not that he likes you. You see, the Old Testament people, they longed for that time when God would live in them, and now we have God living in us. They longed to get what we have, and they said, wow, you got the full favor of God in your life because God lives in you, not just around you. God lives in you. And so we should treasure the fact that God lives in us. It's a blessing to have God within us. That's true empowering, to be empowered by a blessing. What are the components of a blessing? We use, the, use that word. I've tried to change my language instead of have a nice day. I've tried to change my language as I, as I go to say, be blessed today. Some people respond to it. Some people don't. But who cares, you know? Why not say it? Because I want them blessed today. What are the components of a blessing? Galatians 3, 14 says this, He redeemed us in order that the blessings given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. That verse tells us that in the same way that Abraham was blessed, we can be blessed too through Jesus. If you ever read about Abraham in Genesis, you know, he was a blessed man in many, many ways. He didn't always obey God, but he was a blessed man. And so we too can share in that. There's two parts actually to a blessing. If you look up the word, what does it mean to be blessed or how do you get a blessing or how do you give a blessing? There's two parts to it. The first one is, you'll find, it is a spoken word of God's desire. A spoken word of God's desire. Something comes out of your mouth of God's desire towards whatever you are speaking at or whomever that you are speaking at. Before uh, blessings begin by being spoken. Before God took action, He spoke. Before He rewarded those that obeyed Him, He spoke. Even before He disciplined His people, He spoke. He said, you don't have to go through with this, but if you choose not to, this is what's going to happen. He spoke. So blessings start with what we say. And we learned that in the first message, that our words have substance. Obviously, what you speak comes from what you believe. That's true. But what comes out of our mouth makes a difference. The second part of a blessing 
is that whatever is spoken then releases an empowerment to change towards that desire. God has the desire for your life. And then once it's spoken, that you make a change towards that desire. And that's the second part. Yeah, think of Psalm 103. It starts out, bless the Lord of my soul and all that is within me, praise his holy name. That's how it starts. That we start praising God and blessing God for who he is. And then it runs down about five or so benefits or blessings of God. First one it says, he says, he forgives all my sins. Wow, isn't that a blessing? Because, you know, you live in this world and, and I've known people that have done things uh, either knowingly or unknowingly and the world stamps a label on them and they never forgive them. It trails them all through life. We were at uh, George Mason. My son's getting ready to, to enter in George Mason in the fall, and we were at Transfer Parents Day, and, and so they got into their college, and one of the, the ladies said, Now listen, some of you are, are uh, looking forward to government jobs. I'm just going to tell you up front. You better be careful what you do if you want a government security clearance. Don't be stupid. And it can be as simple as downloading an illegal movie. You will not get your government clearance. I mean, she was up front of saying, pay attention to your life. Don't ruin it because the world will mark you and never let you up. God is not like that. God says, I'll forgive you of all your sins. I'll forgive you. I'll set you free. The second thing that he says uh, beyond that is, um, forget not his benefits. He forgives our sins. He heals all my diseases. Wow, isn't that good? That's what God says. That's a blessing. That's, that's favor. He says he redeems my life from the pit. Have you ever been in a pit before? Well, if you've ever been there, God says, I'll redeem you. I'll pull you out. I'll give you a rope. I'll, I'll help you climb out. That's a blessing, isn't it? You're in the pit, and he provides a way out. And then uh, he continues on and says, I'll help you express love and compassion. Are you normally a, a loving and compassionate person? Some of us are, some of us aren't. But the fact is that God says, I'll help you be a person that expresses love and compassion. He says, I'll satisfy you with good things. How about that? God has good things. And then finally, he says, so that you'll be renewed. You out of strength? God will renew you. He'll renew you. That's part of his, his blessing that he wants to give to us. So it all starts when we're praising and thanking God and blessing Him for who He is, that we are reminded of the blessings that He imparts to us. Number three, the process of changing the atmosphere through releasing blessing. We're going to look at, at uh, Peter chapter 3, 1 Peter chapter 3. You have your Bibles or, or your phones. You can turn there with me. And we're going to walk down through several verses to look at this, this process of changing the atmosphere through the blessings of God, receiving and giving the blessings of God. So in 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning at verse 8, previous to this, Peter is talking about unity between husbands and wives. So he really goes into detail about how homes, uh, God's desire is that husbands and, and wives bless one another. And finally, he gets to the rest of the folk. And he says this, verse 8, finally... All of you, if we were in the South, he'd say, all y'all. Finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers and sisters. Be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with a blessing. Because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days, must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. He must turn from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Let me just walk down through these verses here just briefly and, and kind of bring some uh, revelation to them about uh, change powered by blessing. First of all, verse 8 really expresses the desire of God. 
I mean, think about it. As you, as you read what, uh, what Peter writes there, this would be the desire of God. Live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers and sisters. Be compassionate and humble. Wouldn't you love to be in an environment like that? Wouldn't that be great, that to be in your home, that to be in your workplace, that to be in the, in the community? Wouldn't that be wonderful? That is a desire of God, that he would actually get us to, to live like that, live in harmony, live, live in, in humility, live in compassion, live in sympathy, loving one another like brothers and sisters, not to get something from the other person. I was next door having a hamburger this week, or maybe it was last week, it was one day soon, and uh, Freddie next door, he uh, gave me the hamburger and, uh, and the french fries, and, um, and I, uh, I enjoyed it. And after we were done, he looked at me and he said, get out of here. I'm like, what? Get out of here. Be blessed. And I walked up to him and I said, thank you, Freddie. I really appreciate that. I'll send some people over here for you. And he looked at me and he said, it's not about that. He set me straight. You see, I was thinking because he gave me something that I needed to respond back and say, I'll send some people over. And he set me straight. He said, it's not about that. Amen. I got it. I understood what he was talking about. God has a desire for us to live in one another in a way that represents heaven. Are we going for it? Can we do it? Absolutely, with the power of the Holy Spirit and Jesus in the middle. You know, uh, Rachel had a, a friend that she went to school with. Up, um, I don't know, where was she from? Way up north. A gal that came for a week and stayed at our house. I forget her name, but uh, I still remember what she said. She spent a week in our family, and she and Rachel hung out and did some things. So at the end of the week, I, I was asking her, I was like, uh, so... What would you get from being around us for a week? And she started crying. And she said, it wasn't what Rachel and I did. It wasn't they had spent some prayer time together. She said, it was being in, with your family that brought healing to my life. You see, environments do make a difference. I think of Tim and Leisha. You know, they, they had a friend that had a, a, a daughter that was on heroin. And they said, you know, I think God's calling us to take her in our home. Not everybody's called to do that, but God called them. And they showed her a different environment than what she was in. And later on, she accepted Jesus and went into a year teen challenge. But I believe that their, her stay in their home changed something within her. She, she wasn't asking for that. They blessed her. They brought her in. Now they're, they're housing another girl that didn't have a place to go. Just housing them in her home changes the environment for people. It's a big deal. And so God desires to do that in different ways that, that we would, uh, we would uh, do that. Verse 9. Verse 9, he says this. He says, but if we respond with a blessing, we will inherit a blessing. Look at the different ways that we can respond. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with a blessing. So there's actually three different ways that we can respond to a given situation. We can respond evil with evil. We can respond insult with insult. Where's that counsel coming from? Is it coming from the seed in heaven? No, it's coming from the seat in the earth. That's what you need to do. Evil for evil. Insult for insult. That's how the world counsels us. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus has given us counsel in a different way to change the atmosphere and bring blessing. He says that you need to respond with blessing because this is what you were called to do that you may inherit a blessing. There's sowing and reaping going on here, folks. So think about it. If somebody does evil to you or insults you, if you respond back in the same kind, then you're going to reap what you give out. But on the other hand, if they insult you or do evil to you and you go, time out, that's the tough thing. Time out, wait a minute, before I respond, before my tongue, before I give them a tongue licking, 
I'm going to stop and say, wait a minute, I'm going to inherit what I say back to them. I think I'm going to inherit, I think I want to inherit a blessing. I don't want to inherit evil. I don't want to hear, uh, inherit another insult. I want to inherit a blessing. And so therefore, you ask God, okay, how can I say, do for this person that would be unmerited, that would bless them? that would get their attention, that they might wake up and think, God loves me. I'm going to make a change. Happens through blessing. And so, again, we've got sowing and reaping that is taking place here. We need to, to realize. Um, so let's just, you know, play this out for a little bit. Um, Someone does you evil, the world says, you gotta, you got to confront that. you got to win the fight. God says, no, you're going to win the fight when you actually figure out how to bless that person rather than do the same that they did to you. So in other words, if a person's in weakness, can you speak strength? If a person is in lack, can you speak wealth? If there's a person in sickness... Can you speak healing? If there's a person in turmoil, can you speak peace? If a person's in confusion, can you speak clarity? That's what God's asking us to do. And as a result of that, then he says you will inherit a bless blessing. God's watching. That's what the verse says. God is watching. He's looking. He's seeing that you have launched a blessing bomb into their life rather than an evil bomb. And he says, I'm going to bless you. It might not come from that person. Granted, because their intent is insult and evil. It may not come back from them, but it'll come from God in an unsuspecting way because you launched that blessing bomb into their life. And they weren't expecting it. I don't know, does that go together? I guess so. You get the point. So now we realize that we uh, are at a place where we're launching blessing. So what's the other option? We could... Uh, pronounce judgment on them. We could uh, criticize them. We could uh, complain that they're not getting it. We could uh, demean them with further words. So who are we aligning ourselves with when we use that kind of vocabulary? Is it God's? No. It's really with Satan. So we can be followers of Jesus, and yet the words that we speak, we can be aligning ourselves with Satan. Isn't that odd? But that's a reality. And so God wants us to pay attention what we're saying and how we can bless that person. Verse 10 in uh, 1 Peter 3, what we speak has an effect on our days. How about that? Do you realize that uh, what you say over yourself and others can determine how long you live? Whoa, that's what the Word says. It says, whoever would love life and see good deeds must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. And so we have influence by what we say to ourselves and to each other. Verse 11, this is critical. It says in, in verse 11, that says, he must turn from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. What's the point there? The point is that we need to grow past the problem and experience the fullness of relationship. You see, many times we stop at the problem. We identify the problem. We're irritated by the problem. We wish the problem would go away, but we never stop and say, okay, God, you see this problem too. What is your way through it? How do I get through this to honor you and bless that other person? That's what we need to be praying. And when you do that, you experience fullness of relationship that you never had before because currently you just have a problem that's intervening between you and some other person or maybe a group of people. But you stop and say, God, I want to go through this problem to experience fullness of relationship. And many of you do that and yet it's very important. The world would say, the council of the world would say, just identify the problem. That's what we hear on the evening news. We hear a lot of problems identified. But who's coming up with solutions? God has the solutions, and we find them on our face before Him. And then 
verse 12. I love this. This is awesome. Verse 12, it says this. For the eyes of the Lord, listen to this. We talked about, we sang this morning about his face. We want to see his face. It says, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But, his, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So those that are, are doing evil, God's going to deal with them. He asks us to respond differently than the way that they have just given it to us. And so that's the challenge before us to speak a blessing. And in doing so, then they may just say, that was God. I want to know Him. How are you able to do that? And we can share our testimony. You see, speaking out God's desire to others means greater answered prayer for us. Isn't that good news? You want to get greater answered prayers? I do. In fact, uh, Friday morning I was praying with a group called uh, Pray Winchester. We pray every Friday morning from 8 to 9 over at the Park and Recreation Center. We've been praying for I don't know how many years, and we just pray about the city and problems that we see in the city, and we, we ask God to come and show us how to pray and who to pray for. And, and so we were praying, and uh, uh, we got uh, centered on the, the drug situation in Winchester. And so we started praying about the drug situation. And at one point, I just, I just heard prodigal son, and I began to pray, God, just take people just like the prodigal son. If you don't know the story, the prodigal son, he took his father's inheritance he, he went and spent it. He spent it all. And uh, the place he found himself in was feeding pigs and hungry. He had made his father mad. He'd made his brother mad. I mean, he had shamed everybody. And yet he, it's, the scripture says he came to himself. That's what it says. I begin to pray that. God, people are on drugs. I pray that they would come to themselves. They would realize drugs are not the answer. They're just coping. They have addiction. God, we just pray that they would come to themselves. Not one hour later. My brother-in-law and I took trash to the convenience center. Doesn't that sound so much better than dump? I'm convinced that you women, you know, you get company and you go to the restroom together. Men, we get buddies and go take the trash. So my brother-in-law, we're like, uh, you want to take the trash? Yeah, let's take the trash. So on the way to the convenience center to take the trash, we pass a yard sale. It was at a farm. I told him, I said, that's got to be a man's yard sale because it's at a farm. I said, on the way back, we're going to stop. He goes, okay. So we uh, did our due diligence and came back, and we stopped. And sure enough, we walked. You know, most, most yard sales are for women and children. I'm serious. No, I'm not being funny. That's serious. You, you, you rarely find a man's yard sale. So I pulled in. And uh, it was at this farm, and we pulled in, and I'm telling you, it was a man's, man's yard sale. It had band saws and table saws and fans and lawnmowers and, and equipment. I mean, it was just, it was glorious. I didn't buy anything but took away three free t-shirts. That's the only thing I got. But the guy that was holding the yard sale, he started talking. And it was myself and my brother-in-law, David, and another guy. And he said, seven years ago, he said, in the middle of the night, I just realized that I needed to change my life. He's saying this. And he went on to say, he said, man, I was, I was in alcohol and drugs and smoking. And he said, it was ruining me. And in the middle of the night, suddenly I just realized, where am I going? What am I doing? And from that point on, he said, for seven years, I've been totally free. And I'm thinking, there has got to be more to this story. My brother-in-law steps up and he says, did the change reach your heart? I thought, wow, that's a great question. Why didn't I think of that? And then I wondered, does this guy really know what he means? He knew exactly what he meant. He said, a lot of people don't like talking about God and Jesus, but he said, that's what happened. I said, bring it on. He said, I woke up in the middle of the night. He said, I needed three beers in the middle of the night just to get back to sleep. He said, I woke up in the middle of the night and I said, God, if you are real, I need you now. I am desperate for you now. And he said, God came in in the middle of that night and Jesus set me free. And I've been free ever since. 
He said, I had a business. I was making $2,000 a day and blowing it all. And I lost it all. And he said, now, he said, I can't believe it. All those blessings that I never thought I would get back, God's bringing them back to me. He said, I'm not asking for it. It's just coming with heaps. He said, I don't believe it. He said, this is an amazing way to live. I thought, yes, it is. And as I drove out of that man's man's yard shell, God said, see there? You prayed an hour earlier that people would just wake up and knew they needed God. And now you heard a testimony. Granted, it was seven years ago, but he said, if I did it seven years ago, I can do it today. And I said, thank you, Lord. You see, he's waiting for us as people just to get in touch with what does heaven want? What kind of a blessing does heaven want to put on this person and situation? And that we begin to say it and we begin to pray it. And I ask you this morning, if your blessings from God aren't increasing, you need to ask yourself, what am I saying and what am I praying? Do an assessment. What am I saying and what am I praying? Because God never changes. He's never changes. Some of you here this morning, you may be living life with a parking brake on. Seriously. And I mean, I'm telling you what, the smoke is rolling and it's tough. Because you've been living only from the reward of obedience and you mess up time and time again. And all you do is beat yourself up. I'm telling you, stop it. Because there's a greater way to live. Sorry, Teresa. <laughs> uh, Teresa and I have this in inside joke about stop it. It's, it's another story. We don't need to get into it because my time is up. But there is a greater way to live. And that is to know that you're blessed. Because you know Jesus. And he lives inside of you. And he can help you in any given situation. That no matter if evil comes or insults come, you can call time out and say, wait a minute. If I say that back to them, I'm going to get the very thing that I've just said back to them because it's sowing and reaping. Therefore, I don't want that. I want a blessing. And so instead, you stop and say, God, wait. I don't want to give back what they just brought to me. I want to give back what you will bring to them. And it's a blessing. Show me what to say. Show me what to do. The blessing might not come from them. They may not even uh, receive God's blessing. But God sees it. He sees it. And he'll bless you in return in some way. And you'll know it's him. Stand with me. If you're scheduled to pray, pray. I know I've gone longer, but uh, that's all right. It's good. This is the Lord's day, right? Not the Lord's hour. That's the way we're. Plus, we've got a meal to end. I think 50-some people signed up for the meal, and they planned for 80, all right? So those of you that signed up for the meal, again, you're in. But if you didn't sign up for the meal, you're in, all right? So uh, let's enjoy uh, some time, fellowship together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, that you are a blessing God. That's just in your nature. That is who you are. That you love first before we could care whether you loved that you, you give us grace, Lord, in areas that we didn't even think that we could overcome. That's just who you are. And I pray today, Lord, that you would show people if they're living life with a parking brake on, that they're only living from reward and obedience, a works-based rather than a grace-based, love-based. I'm blessed. Therefore, I walk through life blessed and sharing that blessing, Lord. Let us transition today, God, in our hearts. Thank you, Father. I'm going to invite you, if you don't know Jesus this morning, it all starts with him. Just to come and, and pray with one or two or three of these people, just, or pick out one rather, and just to say, you know what, I've gotten away from Jesus, and I need to come back to him. It's just that simple. It's not complicated. Romans says, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and confess with your mouth, that you'll be saved. That's a starting place. It's not the ending place. It's a starting place. If you don't know Jesus, come and give your heart to him. These folks will pray with you and encourage you and get you started. If you realize, you know what? I think I've been living life the parking brake on. Come and pray with these folks. Take it off today. Be reminded that God's blessed you and he wants you to live out of that blessing towards your, your life and others.
Father, I thank you, God, that you have great things in store for us. We're beginning to see beginnings of what it means to have heaven come to earth. And so, Lord, we say, bring it on. And we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Let's worship him. You have something on your heart, you desire prayer, maybe a prayer request this morning that you wrote down. Come and get started. Pray with these folks right now. We don't need to wait till Wednesday until, until the prayer requests come. Come and pray with them now. Be encouraged. Let's worship him.